time is it? Uh, it's 11.44. Yeah, when does the, when does the market close? One o'clock. Got it. What's happened? What's going on? What's going on? It's it's got three percent. We lost like six percent of the stock market in two days. Is that a lot? It's the most we've lost since like uh, December 2018. Your parents, your grandparents, I'm crying. My clients are crying. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty. Easy. Can you tell me why? Yeah. yeah. COVID-19 basically has gripped Europe now. Uh, you got, uh, it's in Italy, uh, it's in Iran. Um, I don't know, I haven't heard from Spain or you know, Egypt or some of the other places. Definitely. It's shut down um, China, uh, releasing members on Friday. Singapore, Korea, other areas. Uh, people aren't calling it a pandemic yet, but you might as well just call it a pandemic because there's no Stop it, stop it. The Harvard uh, professor came out, I guess, this morning or last night and basically said that 70% of the population will probably be afflicted by it at some point. Um, I'm not going to say in the next week or two, but probably at some period of time. I don't think you can really stop at this point, so there's going to have to be some kind of vaccine or some kind of cure that's going to have to be developed pretty quickly because you can't just shut down civilizations and you can't shut down and quarantine uh, economies. This could be the uh, triggering event um, that uh, sends the global economy of the U.S. into a recession. And the global central banks have already started to move within 48 hours to start to pump uh, massive amounts of liquidity into the system to keep it from seizing up and allow for the capital markets to continue to uh, function and to uh, uh, for capital flows to continue on a, on a global basis. Sorry. Okay. Everybody likes to shoot the messenger, but you know, reality is reality, and this, these are the factors that we're uh, dealing with right now. So you might want to uh, make sure that if you guys do get sick, um, don't come to school. Uh, be really careful what you eat. Uh, be careful if you're traveling. Be careful who you talk to. I mean, I even have colleagues now that won't even shake my hand. So it's just the reality of the, the, the situation. Um, where is the uh, where's oil prices trading right now? Come on, get on the computers and start looking for the information. It's easy to sit back and not do the work, but you're going to be expected to look at this information very quickly from internal and external databases and give us the managers the information we need to make decisive decisions. And this is a decisive decision. Brent Cruz at 5505. Is what? At 55. Yeah. Is it up or down? Down. How much? 1.29 percent. And why? Come on, you guys. Is the supply? Paying you 125,000 bucks a year. <clears throat> You're sitting in the meeting, um, paying you to basically to respond and interact either. with us. It's not um, a large you demand. Don't, we'll find other people who do. Yes. Transportation's down. Not a large demand. People are stopping flights. Yeah. Exactly. Huge global supply. Exactly. So you know, less, significantly less production, traveling, which consumes a lot of oil. Well, you got basically the global oil markets that are being flooded, and I wouldn't be surprised if oil continues to drop. It hasn't taken a major hit yet, uh, but I think it could actually drop significantly in the next couple of weeks. What's it going to do to oil price, oil company stocks? Come on, you guys. What's it going to do to oil company stocks? Now, that's not something I would do to my boss. It's going to go down, okay? And if oil company stocks go down, what happens to the stock market index? It goes down. Got it. Okay, everybody's got to participate. I got to train you on this now. Okay, uh, where's gold trading right now? Per ounce, one thousand six forty-five. Okay, is it up or down? Down. Okay, Yahoo Finance get up there. It's down. I what? It says it's up. Is it up? That's probably impossible. Where are you getting the data? Gold prices today. Yeah, uh, gold prices today is are up three percent. If you go to Yahoo Finance, what does it tell you? Even though you're down twenty-five. Yeah, okay, so it's down. Uh, there's two counteractions going on right now. When you're analyzing gold, one of the major factors that drives gold prices up or down is geopolitical risk. Is the COVID-19 a geopolitical risk? Yes. Would you think that gold prices would go up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what is gold? Is gold a commodity? Is gold a commodity? Yes. yes. Does it track inflation? Yeah. Yes. So if gold prices are going down, what does that tell you about future inflation? Going up. Okay, how does that work? 
if gold is highly correlated to inflation, and if gold prices are going down, how does inflation go? If you're using gold as the economic indicator to, to forecast inflation. Gold's a commodity, it tracks inflation. If gold prices are going down, what does that tell you about future inflation? So if gold is worth less, then the value of the dollar goes down, and then um, it's more inflated? Well, the uh, people buy gold as a hedge against uh, devaluation of currencies. Okay? The people aren't buying gold. Okay? They're actually selling gold. You would think that they would be buying gold because of this geo massive geopolitical event, but they're not. They're actually selling gold. So what does that tell you about future inflation if gold prices are cor correlated to inflation? Inflation's going down. Inflation, inflation expectations are going down. What does that tell you about future economic activity? Is economic activity correlated to prices? If there's higher demand, do prices go up? <coughs> Come on, but, yeah. yes. If, uh, if economic activity goes down, do prices go down? Yes, because there's less supply. So if gold prices are going down, what does that tell you about future inflation? Huh? It's going to go down. And what does that tell you about future economic activity if inflation is tied to economic activity? It's going to go down. Now, how does that work? How does that work? <clears throat> Let me go through the logic again. Gold prices are geopolitical you know, store of wealth. People go into gold when there's high geopolitical risk. Gold prices are going down, so the market is not buying gold based on high geopolitical risk. They are selling gold. Gold is a commodity. Gold is tied to the inflation rate. If gold prices are going down, then future inflation is expected to do what? Go down. And if, and if inflation is tied to economic activity, if gold prices are going down, then future economic activity is going to go down. So why did gold go up yesterday then, when we saw the same drop in Fear. Dow? Fear. And then today is It's the factor on, on recession. Okay. So they're not focused on fear now, they're focused on recession. They've sold their gold, they've sold their stocks, and they bought what? You can't buy air. Bond. Okay. Bond. So you're in the stock market, you have a bunch of wealth, managing a multi-billion dollar portfolio. My clients are calling me worried that they're losing money in the stock market. Where are they going to put their money? Is it bond? In the bond market, market. Yeah. exactly. So where's the <coughs> treasury yielding right now? Up to that. Uh, I don't think it is. is it? The stock market's down like almost 3% of 1,000 points. They're selling off their stock in gold. They're buying what? Yeah, come on, you guys. They're buying what? They're buying bonds. If they're buying bonds, what happens to bond prices? They go up, and interest rates go. How's that work? Come on, you guys. Um, people are selling their stock and selling their, their gold. They're buying bonds, bond prices go up, and interest rates go down. Okay, let's try that again. People are I'm going to just go over it again like 100 times until you get sick, until I get full participation. Because this is a finance class, and I got to train train you on this stuff. Because when they hire you, they look at your degree, and they look at your GPA, and they look at the courses that you took, and they hire you based on your GPA and the courses in your major. You know, you got to understand the finance. So if they're selling off the stock, they're selling off the bonds. They buy the bonds. Bond prices are going to go uh -oh. up, and interest rates are going to go down. And where's the ten-year Treasury yielding right now? One point three. One point three. 1.3. And where was it two days ago? Where was it a week ago? 1.5. 1 1.5. And it's at 1.3. So 1.5, okay, the yield on a 10-year treasury of 1.5, how many basis points is that? How many basis points is 1.5%? 150 basis points. And where's the 10-year treasury yielding now? 130 or 1.3 percent or 100. So what's 150? The, my students in the last class were having a problem with the math. What's 150 minus 130? 20 basis points. Got it. So the 10-year Treasury has has basically compressed by 20 basis points 
in less than a week. That's a huge move. Okay, that's a huge move. And global central banks are buying up their bonds, driving up bond prices and driving down interest rates to mitigate the damage that's being conducted right now by the virus economically on a global basis. And the Federal Reserve is going to race to the bottom. As they drop their interest rates, our interest rates are going to be significantly higher than their interest rates. They're going to sell a lot of their stuff in the foreign markets. They're going to convert to the US dollar, and they're going to buy our treasuries because the interest rates are a lot higher than theirs, which is going to further drive up bond prices and drive down our interest rates. So then what about the Fed's trying to cut interest rates? The Fed's going to cut interest rates. The Fed should be cutting, having an emergency meeting uh, yesterday to cut interest rates this morning to inject liquidity into the system to calm everybody down. They didn't do that, so the market dropped another thousand points. You think they need to do that, even yes. though they're at record yes. lows? they need to be decisive on this. Can it push yields negative, though? No, we'll go over that in, in the lecture. Okay. Um, they said they won't, but who knows? Do people ever lie? Yeah. Say they're not going to do something and end up doing it anyway? Yeah. All the time. Particularly politicians and institutions. So we're kind of at a, a, a critical point right here. We'll see um, how everybody responds. Okay. But there needs to be more decisive um, action on a global basis by all the governments, all the central banks, and all the health agencies. Because it's, it's basically going to be probably, we're probably at a pandemic because we don't know, uh, you know how many people actually have it and they've misdiagnosed a significant portion of the people who actually have it uh, and have negatively detected it from them because they're using the wrong detection mechanism. So just be really careful and watch what happens because we're going through history uh, this week. All right, um, what about the uh, uh, dollar to the pound, dollar to the euro? Where are they, where's the currencies trading? That should tell us what's going on because there's massive capital flows that flow across the globe, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, instantaneously, constantly, um, looking for yields, avoiding risk. Yes, sir. Uh, the euro is up. Yeah, what is it? Dollar to the euro, what is it? Uh, 1.088. Uh, 1.088, so 1.09. Mm -hmm. Got it. So is it, has it gone up or down? Up 0.26%. Uh, okay, so if it costs us more to buy a, a euro, has the dollar uh, appreciated or depreciated? If it costs us more to buy a euro, does the dollar appreciate or depreciate? Depreciated. Depreciated. Excellent. And where's the uh, dollar to the pound? Uh, dollar is 0.7. No, no, uh, flip it. Uh, 0.7. No, flip it. What's the uh, dollar to the pound? 130. Uh, 130. Is it up or down? It is up. Okay, so the dollar the dollar's depreciating against the pound, Joe. Okay. So the question is, is why is the dollar depreciating okay, against the pound? It's probably because the, the market thinks we're going into a recession. That's one reason. Uh, lower yields, uh, you know, lower stock market returns, lower real estate returns, potential recession. Um, those could be factors uh, that are affecting the dollar. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's it. Let's do the exam. Let's go through it together. You got your blue books. Take lots of notes. Try to um, go through this as much as possible. Do you have an extra copy? Uh, yeah, there's one on the uh, on the course website. You can print it out. Okay. Oh, I'd like to hold on. I'm hold on. Yeah. Here, I'll give you one. I just don't want. I want one to give you one and then having to get three out and then I'm out of my, my exams. All right. Yeah. But everybody's got their exams. Yeah, okay. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's go through the first one. All right. first when building a forecast, oh, James and Eileen would probably know this better than um, when building a forecast model, what are the first steps or questions that need to be taken? What are the first questions you would ask? So this world plan. Um, I'm the managing director of, let's say, manufacturing and sales for Intel. Um, 
I come up to you, you're, you're a new hire, you're working with us for about a year now. Uh, I need you um, to build a forecast model for us, because especially now with COVID-19, we need to be able to forecast our sales for the next for the quarter, um, be able to advise our production teams uh, how much they need to produce, and then we need to be able to forecast revenues and earnings and the impact on our stock price and our stock returns going forward um, over the next four quarters, but maybe over the next two years. What's the first question that you ask? Will, the first thing is, um, will you build it? Will you build me the model? What's your answer? Yes. Yes. Okay. If you say no, you'll find somebody else, and then you just you just ruined your career. Did you say a model? Yeah. Um, I want you to build a forecast model because of the COVID nineteen, we need to be able to forecast out these four quarters, what the impact will be on sales, production, revenue, earnings, um, the stock price, and the return on the stock. There's probably going to be a lot of other questions that are going to be asked. So the first thing is, is when I ask you if you can build me the model, the first answer to the question is yes. Because you're going to, you're going to need to know this now. What's the second question that you come out of your mouth? You work for a company, a consultant, basically internal to the company. Do you trust this model? The model hasn't been built. What variables? Yeah. Uh, do you know of any variables that should be included in the model? Exactly. Do you think that the person has, that's asking you to do it has experience working in the company, working in the industry? Do you think they have an idea of what factors should be in the model? Do you think that maybe they've built one of these models before, but they just don't have time to build it, so they've asked you to do it? Yeah. Okay. Well, give me some other questions that you might ask that you need to know. <coughs> what? Yeah, what do you need? Uh, give me a couple more. What else do I need to know? Historical data. Uh, yeah, that's good. You know, do we have the data? Okay. If we don't have the data, what do we need to get the data? If we don't have the data and we need the data, what do we need to get the data? If you don't have something and you need something, what do you need to get what you need? Research it. That ain't going to get you. No, what do you need? I need the data. We don't have the data. What do I need to get the data? Access to it. Okay. Okay. But how do I get access to some data if it's proprietary? What do I need? What do I need to do the project? Need money, right? They're paying me, so obviously the money the project's going to cost. I might need I might need to buy the data. So if I'm talking about cost, what do I need? Money. What? Money. Yeah, but what do I need for the project? I need funding, but that's called what? Budget. Budget. I'm going to need a budget. What's the budget? Exactly. Okay. And then what other questions should I ask? We're getting close to all. Once you've done one of these projects, the questions are just over and over again. You do the same thing, you do it over and over again. And then that's what you're going to do in your career. You're going to be working on projects, and you're going to do them over and over again over your career. And they get easier and easier. The projects get harder, but the process you know, is standardized. What else do you need to know? You've been asked to build this model. What else do you need to know? We know the, we know the budget, we know the time. Are you going to do it yourself? What you need to know if somebody else is going to work with you on it? Am I going to be working on this by myself? Do I have internal resources to do it? Am, are, am I going to be able to hire a consultant or consultants to help me based on the scope of the project? Okay. All right. So that's really important that you write down that list. If you know when somebody asks you a question for you to do something, First thing is yes, and then the second thing is you interview the individual, 
to help you with it. You find out who's going to help you with it, how much, when is it due, is there any money available to be able to do it. Um, have you done it before? Has anybody done it before in the company? Um, you know, and then you go talk to those people and you interview those people um, so that you can you know, hurry up and build the model. Okay? And if the model's already been built and the team's already done it, that's going to allow you to be able to accelerate the, uh, the project. How would you determine the dependent and independent variables? Well, we already told you what the dependent and dependent variables were. It's going to be different based on the client and the division that you're in, which you're going to be forecasting. But we've already, you know, I've already told you that what we need is sales, production, revenue, earnings, stock price, and stock return. Okay. So we already know what the dependent variables are because I told you. So usually determining the dependent variable is going to be based on who the person is that's asking you for the information and what company, within what industry, within what division you work in is going to determine the dependent variables that you need to be able to forecast. How do you get to the independent variables? How do you select the independent variables? How do you pick them? This is a brainstorming session. You know, what I find is like a lot of students will just wait for the answers, for somebody else to answer for you instead of you answering for yourself. So what you're doing is you're just waiting for somebody to give you the answer instead of going through the creative thought process that really creates innovative companies. They're looking for creative people that can just brainstorm stuff. So how do you get, how do you get to the independent variables? How do you identify the independent variables that you're going to put in the wall or at least test? Where's the, where in the budget does it list the independent variables? Uh, You're the one who has to come up with the independent variables. So where do you get the independent variables? Research. What? Research. Yeah, so one place, the place I would go first is the person that asks you to build the model. Ask them, what variables do you think should be in the model? Bam. Do you think they'll know? Do you think they'll know? Yeah, they'll know. Yeah, they're probably a senior person that just doesn't have time to build the model. They have enough experience. That's why they're asking to do it. Okay, so ask them first right off the bat. Do you think other people in the company would know? Do you think other people in the company would know how to forecast, you know, sales and production and revenue and earnings and that stuff? Yeah. So then you go talk to a bunch of people across different functions of the organization that can help guide you in identifying variables that should be put in the model. Excellent. Uh, what are other sources? You said research. Uh, re what research? You said research. What research? Uh, research on whatever the topic is. I don't know. Now, where would you get the research? Uh, online databases. Okay, perfect. So you can go to online databases. Um, to The databases are usually have the data. I'm looking for the variables in the model. Variables are the data, but I'm not going to. I could go to the data first, but that would be data mining. I'm usually going to go to some other place, like talking to experts first, you know, to get validation, both internally and externally, externally from the firm. So you may know <coughs> other individuals that have done this kind of work before. Can't you ask them? Yeah. If it's a non proprietary project, you could say, hey, we're trying to forecast, you know, sales and revenue and production. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys have already built it. It's the first time I've built it. You know, what was the model that you used and what were the factors that you used in the model, if you don't mind me asking? So you could use outside um, experts. What other source? What other source? Come on, be creative. You guys have all done research before. The news? Right? Maybe what? Like current events that could be. Uh, probably not current events, but you're, no, because the current events is just sporadic. Right. Or like, so like past trends maybe? Uh, now you're doing data analysis. I'm looking for sources. I was going to say like expenses of the company or like liabilities. Uh, no, because that doesn't give me the research. Okay. You know, I'm specifically looking for research that has been done or experts in the field 
that have conducted the research in the past that can guide me on the model and on the variables. Yeah. Can you look at like previous models that have been built? Yeah, where would I get that research? Uh, you could somehow, or you could ask other people. Like, yeah, but when it, well, I've already done all that. Where else do I go? Because I could be exhausted. Where else do I go to find research? Well, this is going to be a little embarrassing for you. What? Library? Yep, exactly. Do you guys have a library? Yeah. Could you skip over there and uh, ask the reference librarian what uh, online resources, uh, what type of articles are we looking for? <coughs> are we looking for New York Times articles or are we looking for something uh, scholarly more? Scholarly research. Scholarly research. We're looking for peer reviewed journal articles. Exactly. So we're going to go up there and see if there's any, been any published research that has been done on our subject area both industry research and academic research that could guide us and validate our model and our variables. Got it. Okay, excellent. Um, how would you test for variable and model significance? If I'm testing uh, the individual variables and I'm using regression, what am I using? You guys already did it on your pretest. And the question was often. So if I'm running a regression, a local regression, what test am I using to test for statistical significance of the independent variables, the ability to predict the dependent variable? So the, uh, how do you test the variables? What would be the test for the individual variable? Do you have a pretest? Do you have to figure it out? Uh, you can use the Z and the T. Yeah, I'd use the T test, exactly. And what about for the model? What about the model there? Uh, R squared. Uh, you could use the R squared, exactly. Give me another. Uh, oh, thanks. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. What else? I like the P score. You can use the P. What else? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we get the P, we get the adjusted R square, we get the R square, we get the T, P statistic, right? Eliminate between plus and minus 2. Something between plus and minus 1.25 would be nice. What's a, what's a test for uh, the model significance? <coughs> test statistic. And if you get an F of between 5 and 8, that's pretty good. If you got 12 to 13, it's a little high. And if it's between 15 and 23, it's really high and you got more big linearity. Okay. Um, if you were experiencing multi linearity in your model, what if you had two variables that were highly correlated to the dependent variable and correlated to themselves? How would you decide which one to keep and which one to throw out? So here's your equation right here. Okay. You should probably write all this stuff down. So y hat equals alpha plus uh, beta hat 1, which is your regression coefficient of the weight, uh, times the uh, first variable, uh, beta hat 2, x2, beta hat 3, x3, beta hat 4, x4, beta x5, x5, and then the, uh, the error term that you want to minimize, mean square error. How many variables do you want to have in your model? You want to have no more than how many? Uh, if I have 30 variables in my model, my adjusted, my F statistic and my adjusted R square are going to be off the roof. Okay. So what's the limit? How many variables do, should there, yeah, no more than five. And even with five, you're going to run into what? What's the problem? Multi-linearity, exactly. So I got two variables in the model that are highly correlated to each other. It's also correlated to the independent variable. And the way I can test for that is to run a correlation matrix. And I can, I can identify that by using a correlation matrix. 
they got two variables highly correlated to each other. One's correlated to, you know, they're both highly correlated to the dependent variable. These two are highly correlated. I got both in collinearity. How do I decide which one to keep and which one to throw out? Which one do I keep? And which one do I throw out? This one has a T statistic of 1.75. This one's got a T statistic of 1.25. Which one do I keep and which one do I throw out? You keep the one that's closer. Uh, never mind. What? <coughs> the one with the highest T statistic and the one that's more correlated? No, isn't it the other way around? The, the one that's lower is better? Or do you want the higher one? Yeah, you want the higher. Oh, okay. Is that the right answer? Do I keep the one with the highest T statistic or do I keep the one that's been cited the most in the literature? The one that's been cited the most in the literature because that variable has come up over and over and over again over the years using different data sets. Okay? So it's not random, it's persistent. So it's theory. Okay? So it's theory. It's the literature. Got it. Uh, what is internal, internal and external validity? Well, internal validity was your discussions that you had with the experts internal to the firm. And you got them to buy off on your model. External validity is what? Yeah, the external research. Uh, uh, using peer-reviewed journal articles, both academic and industry, that basically validate your model, your approach. And then now that's all you have to do is build the model back test the model and forward test the model and track it over a period of time to see if it did a good job of forecasting. And if it did a good job of forecasting, then you're going to do this. Run the research, write up the report, stick it in PowerPoint, make the presentation to the senior level executives, and make your recommendation. And unfortunately, your recommendation, like my recommendation has been in the past, is because I'm forecasting based on our research that the uh, quarterly sales for the firm are going to drop significantly over the next eight quarters, and my recommendation would be to lay off a significant portion of the staff. Yeah. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. That's a real tough one. Because when I did that last time, um, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. And they tried to hide the information, actually. Um, because they didn't want everybody to hear about it. They didn't want the board to hear about it. They didn't want the investors to hear that the recession was coming and that the uh, earnings for the company was going to fall significantly and the stock price was going to go down. Uh, that happened to... Uh, that happened to some other firms where you had internal knowledge of impending recessions and the impact on sales, revenues, and earnings, and stock prices. Does this sound familiar? Where the senior level executives actually had privy to the information and actually sold off shares within the company based off of insider information and were able to liquidate a significant portion of their holdings within the company's shares prior to the announcement. He ended up getting fired after that. Yeah, it happens. Okay, so that's the first one. Now let's do the let's do B. Macroeconomic foundation. Unorthodox monetary policy, quantitative easing, and negative interest rates. Okay, this is not even mentioned in the book, and I don't even think it's mentioned in your macroeconomics course that you took at the UC, you know, three years ago or two years ago. Or was even probably mentioned in the background class. Um, because this is the reality of what's going on right now. These are the issues and these are the conversations that are being discussed at very high levels within corporations. And if you guys want to work your way up to becoming a manager, you got to understand this stuff now. Okay. So the biggest problem that we confronted over the last 10 years is we fell into one of the worst recessions ever post-World War II in 2008 and 9, which lasted four years. It was twice as deep and twice as long as any other recession post World War II. So it was extremely destructive. Okay. Um, we implemented unorthodox monetary policy at the Federal Reserve. We printed 
trillions and trillions of dollars out of thin air and basically bought up with government bonds in the open market, driving bond prices up and interest rates down significantly low, and in some cases to zero. And in Japan and in Europe, they drove their interest rates negative, never been done before. So basically, monetary policy, that's never been tested. Okay. So the 300-pound gorilla right now, which is now the COVID-19 issue, is also, will the Federal Reserve drive interest rates negative to basically keep, them, keep us from going into a depression or into a severe recession again? Okay. So that's really the, the question. So if you look at the Fed's balance sheet, you know, I would take pictures of this and write this down in your book, and write this down in your book, write this piece down right now. So basically the balance sheet, and I'll go through this slowly, the balance sheet for the Fed is basically equal to the reserves. The Fed has assets and liabilities, and assets and liabilities, as you know from your financial accounting, need to be equal, okay? So the balance sheet equals the reserves, okay? It, they're really close, all right? And this kind of tells the story of what we've gone through over the last 10 years and what we might go through over the next 10 years depending on how things play out. So in, from 1950 to 2000, the Federal Reserve held about $250 billion of US Treasury securities on their balance sheet as inventory. And they used that inventory of securities to buy and sell bonds through the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, conducting open market operations to basically buy and sell bonds. If they buy bonds, bond prices go up and interest rates go down. So they would buy bonds to drive prices up and interest rates down to stimulate the economy if the economy was going into a recession. Then they would sell the bonds to drive bond prices down and interest rates up to cool the economy if the economy was overheating or the capital markets were exhibiting asset price policy. So the inventory of securities was about 250 billion for decades, for about 50 years. And then, leading up after the first recession, or the recession in 2001 through three, which was a pretty severe recession where the Fed injected massive amounts of liquidity into the system, the balance sheet grew to about 850 billion. And then the financial crisis hit in 2008-9 through 2010-11, and the Federal Reserve printed and ballooned its balance sheet to $5.3 trillion. So basically what? Almost quadrupled it, and then created five times the balance sheet by printing money out of thin air. Sounds crazy, but um, I think they had to use desperate measures because this, that was a desperate situation because the system was imploding and we're going to fall into a depression. Basically. So then, the Fed, as the economy started to recover, the Fed started to unwind its balance sheet and actually brought its uh, its balance sheet down to about 4.1 trillion about a year ago, year or two ago, and then. Over the last year, they started quantitative easing again, and is now printing about 800 billion, 50 to 80, sorry, 50 to 80 billion a month that they're injecting into the system for liquidity purposes. So the Fed is reintroducing quantitative easing. Okay. And I believe the, the balance sheet will just continue to probably grow because of the COVID virus and the economic impacts associated with it. And if we go into a recession, they'll probably continue to increase the balance sheet to backstop the stock market and backstop the economy. So I don't know where it's going to go, but this kind of tells you the unorthodox monetary policy and the extreme um, provisions that the Federal Reserve made over the last 10 years um, to conduct monetary policy. Never seen it before, no research on it. We don't know what the short, medium, and long term implications are. Um, but I think we're going to find out. And we did find out because when the Fed ballooned the balance sheet from 
from 850 to 5, 530, 5.3. There was so much liquidity into the system that it injected into the global capital markets and created hyperinflation in the Middle East as the money flooded the Middle East, created hyperinflation, and then set off the Arab Spring because everybody started to riot because of the hyperinflation. They were watching their purchasing power and basically their standards of money collapse. And that was the first trigger of social unrest on a global basis. And then we saw populism and authoritarianism come in over the last 10 years to basically supplant democratic capitalism as the model um, that we've been under for about the last 80 years. Sorry to you know, put, make this an economic history class, but I at least share some of my insights uh, with you. So what we found out is that um, over the last 10 years, um, even though the Fed's balance sheet has increased so much, we've ne we haven't seen a, a significant improvement in gross domestic product or seen any real inflation, depending on how you measure it, of course. So I couldn't figure out, you know, for the first seven years after 2010, why the economy continued to go up, grow well below the Fed's target, and inflation was below the Fed's target. I couldn't figure it out because they were pumping all this money into the system. Why wasn't it flowing through to inflation in real GDP? So I thought about it and came up with this model. Well, we need to write this down, the quantity theory of budget, the QTF. We need to write all this stuff down. So the solution, the problem, was in the quantity theory of money. Now, Irving Fisher, remember Irving? We love Irving. He invented the Fisher equation. And you know how much we love that. You know, real rates plus inflation expectations equals double interest rates. So Irving Fisher came up with quantity theory of money. And he basically stated that the model looks like this. Real gross domestic product, real GDP, times the inflation rate is related to or equal to the velocity of money measured by M1 or M2. These are the monetary aggregates. M1 is just hard currency in the economy, and M2 is near, not only currency, but also near cash, like money market mutual funds and stuff like that that, that can be converted very quickly uh, into cash. And velocity is the number of times that the currency circulates in the economy. So when the economy is doing really well, and everybody's spending and investing, velocity ramps up. And when you go into a recession, and people aren't investing and consuming as much, Velocity slows down. Okay. Times MS, which is the money supply growth rate. Money supply growth rate. Now the Federal Reserve controls money supply, doesn't control velocity, and is trying to influence inf inflation and trying to influence GDP. Okay. Yes, sir. What did you say M1 and M2 were again? These are M1 is a monitoring aggregate. Um, that measures the amount of hard currency in the economy. And M2 is not only the hard currency, plus near cash, like money market mutual funds, where you can write a check on them. Um, they're near cash. So they're financial securities that are near cash. Okay. They act like cash. They're just as near. Um, any other questions? So here's what the Fed has done, or let me go through the targets. So the Fed has tried to target gross domestic product <coughs> and inflation. And the target for the Fed is 3% for real GDP and 2% for inflation. Now let's do the analysis and see if the Fed's been able to get <coughs> the targets. I just went um, online and took a look from the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the Bureau, uh, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. In the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the last two quarters, the GDP for the United States has grown of an annual rate of between 2.1 and 2.2%. 2 
So has the Fed hit the target? No. Got it. Okay. Um, in 2017 and 18, um, GDP averaged around 3%. So did the Fed hit the target? Yes. Yes. Got it. And in the prior 10 years, prior to 2017, 10 through 16, GDP ran around 2.3%. So did the Fed hit the target? The inflation rate, the inflation target is 2%. Okay. I just went online, calculated the uh, annual uh, consumer price index, year over year change in the consumer price index in February, and it's running at about 2.5%. So did the Fed, Fed hit or exceed the target? Yeah, it's exceeding the target. Um, between 2017 and 18, the CPI was running around 1.8%. So did they hit the target? And in the prior, between 2010 and 16, CPI was running at about 1.5%. Did they hit the target? So if they're not hitting the target, if you're holding inflation and velocity constant, if the Fed's not hitting GDP targets, what are they not doing with the money supply? They're not increasing it fast enough. Got it. If we hold GDP constant, and the Fed's not hitting inflation targets, what are they not doing with the money supply? If they're not hitting inflation targets, what are they not doing with the money supply? Yeah, they're not growing it fast. Even though I looked at this, this is um, the current year over year, but if you look at the between January and February, prices will actually fall. Okay. So that could be an early indicator. Um, if you look at the money supply growth rates historically, between 2008 and 10, in the depths of the recession, you know, careening into a financial crisis, the Fed was growing the money supply about 30 to 40 percent. The in normal times and over the long run, the money supply growth rate has averaged the long run average of GDP. So it kind of gives you an idea you know, of the extremity in which the Federal Reserve went to to basically backstop the stock market and backstop the economy. But then recently, over the last, I would say, not this year, but prior two years. The money supply growth rate started to slow and was averaging around 5 to 8 percent. And currently, uh, the money supply growth rate has gone up again and is now averaging around 8 to 10 percent. And I bet if I look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, uh, this has probably gone up. Because right? what's the Fed trying to do? It's trying to increased GDP. Okay. And if the Fed sees that we're going into a recession or a significant slowdown because of COVID-19 and basically the battle between you know, Trump and you know, other global you know, trade blocks because of the trade negotiations, which actually caused a lot of those emerging markets to fall into recession, and COVID could pull us into a recession, what should the Fed be doing in regards to the money system? What should it be doing? More. Yeah, growing money supply at a faster rate. Okay. But here's the issue. The Federal Reserve has pumped a bunch of money into the system with no real effect on GDP, long-term GDP, or long-term inflation. So if you relax the velocity of money, and I'm trying to target inflation, and the Federal Reserve is increasing the money supply to get the inflation rate to go up, and if inflation is not going up, what's happening to the velocity of money? It's going down. It's going down. And actually, the velocity of money has collapsed. Okay. 
Velocity of money, if you look at it going back to 1970, it's pro-cyclical. So it goes up during recovery peak periods, and it goes down during the of recessions. And it peaked in about 1998. And since then, it's gone down and up over the business cycles. But after the last um, recession, it collapsed and broke through its 1970 support. And the velocity of money has collapsed on a global basis. So why is the velocity of money collapsed? Anybody think of any reason why the circular nature, nature of the velocity of money in the economy has basically collapsed and made monetary policy more difficult than ever before in its history? Could it be because there's so much money in the markets? Um, well, there's not a lot of liquidity in the markets, and a lot of the money is being held somewhere else. So maybe you should write these down. I did the research. Okay. So one of the reasons why velocity of money has collapsed is because people are scared of another recession, a severe recession. So under Keynesian theory of precautionary balances, people are holding huge cash balances to be able to live off of if a severe recession ever came again. So people are people and corporations are holding huge ca precautionary cash balances, which has caused the velocity of money to collapse. There's just not a lot of money in circulation. Uh, the other is um, the global banking system, you know, the shadow banking system. Uh, after the financial crisis and after financial reform of financial institutions, um, they became shadow banks. So when the Fed injected all this liquidity into the system, those banks were there to basically borrow all that money, take all that money send it out into the globe through high-speed uh, telecommunication networks to invest in other countries and other securities to arbitrage across the globe. So the money didn't sit, stay, the velocity, the money didn't stay in the system. There was huge leakage of system of all that liquidity that went out of the system and caused the velocity of money to collapse. Uh, the other is low Labor productivity. Labor pr productivity has declined um, over the last 10 years, for one. And then the last one, which I think is the most important, is that the velocity of money is highly correlated to the labor market, to labor participation rates, employment, and income, a real wage growth. Now, the unemployment rate is at an all-time low, but the underemployment rate is double the unemployment rate. So if the unemployment rate is 4%, the underemployment rate is 8 Labor participation rates are at historical lows. So even though you have low unemployment, there's a huge, huge pool of labor that has basically left the labor force, namely males, uh, between the ages of uh, 45 and 65 have left the workforce because they just couldn't find jobs and because of discrimination and other institutional factors. They did really hard for them uh, to be able to re-enter the workforce. So you have this huge pool of labor that's sitting there idle and their skill sets are deteriorating and they're not making any money. And if they did, they would be investing it, consuming it, buying stuff which would cause the velocity of money to increase and GDP infl and inflation to go up. So it's not a monetary policy issue. It's a fiscal policy issue. It's labor policy. Okay. And basically, Congress and the President are not willing to conduct wholesale labor policy, particularly immigration policy. So the velocity of money will continue to be low. The Fed will print billions or trillions of dollars, who knows how high the uh, balance sheet is going to go, to try to re-stimulate the economy to reach its inflation and GDP targets. But in my view, monetary policy is somewhat ineffective, uh, loot, and impotent in, in some ways. Okay? And that's what we're confronting right now. And you'll read over the next 48 hours that central banks are now injecting massive amounts of 
liquidity into the system to try to drive this up or keep this from turning negative and this from turning negative and falling. Okay. The velocity of money maxed out at about nine times. It's currently around six. And it actually was starting to move up, but I bet it starts to, it's, it's still at historic levels right now. So really the problem in this, this equation is not here, here, or here, it's here. Okay. And there's no policy to address this. We made recommendations, others have made recommendations to try to cure for this, but it's labor policy, not monetary policy. Okay. Congress, the Fed. Okay. Two different institutions, two different political uh, dynamics. Okay. So then the question becomes if we fell into a recession, would the Fed drive interest rates negative? And the, and the answer is yes. I mean, the Federal Reserve used zero interest rate policy. Europe and Asia, particularly Japan, used negative interest rate policies. So they've already done it. Negative interest rate policy has not worked for Japan and other countries in Asia. It has not worked for the European Union. But the problem is, is that as economic activity starts to go down, and if you use the Fisher equation, as inflation expectations start to go down and maybe turn negative, interest rates could turn negative. So the question is, will the Federal Reserve drive interest rates negative? They've said no, but I don't believe anybody. Okay. They say no, but they may actually do it. If things get really severe, they could drive interest rates negative because a lot of their interest rates are already near zero already because of the last recession. So there's a high probability that the Fed will drive interest rates negative in an extreme unorthodox monetary policy um, provision. Okay. Um, what else? I look at the Fisher equation. If you're going to drive interest rates negative because inflation is going to turn negative, which is called disinflation, or if asset prices deflate, <coughs> that's called disinflation. Disinflation is commodity prices falling. Deflation is asset prices falling. The capitalistic system does not work in a disinflationary or a deflationary environment. There has to be some inflation. The models, the economic and finance models were not designed to, for disinflation and deflation. Um, Janet Yellen, before she got fired, um, basically said, uh, had the banks stress test their balance sheets to see how they would weather under a negative interest rate policy. So the discussion's already um, Jerome Powell has already talked about negative interest rates in his last congressional testimonies. He said he won't do it, but you never know. And most of the major banking institutions do not recommend going to negative interest rates because we've seen that it's done in Japan and we've seen that it's done here. Um, oh, another reason why the velocity of money has collapsed is extremely high debt levels. High debt, both personal debt, corporate debt, and government debt. So a lot of the money that otherwise would have been used to invest, save, and consume is being used to service the interest on the debt. So it's just sucking all that money out of the system uh, to service the debt. That's another, put that in your list. So the question will be, if we do have negative interest rates, what would be the impact on the economy? Okay. Well, if the Federal Reserve drives down interest rates, it's going to make the cost of capital for companies a lot cheaper. Okay. And we can use the weighted average cost of capital, which is the calculation in which companies look at when they make investment decisions. They look at their cost of the debt, the bonds, and the cost of the equity, the stocks. The weighted average cost of capital calculation is the cost of the equity. 
when you calculate the cost of the equity, you use the capital asset pricing model, which is the risk-free rate, which is interest rates, plus the beta times the return on the market minus the risk-free rate, times the weight of the equity, the weight in which you're using, how much equity are you using on your balance sheet, plus the cost of the debt, and since bonds, bond interest rates, when a company issues its bonds, the interest rates it's pay, it pays is tax deductible. So there's a tax shield associated with it, times the weight of the debt. And when you come up with the cost of the debt, you can calculate, you can calculate the yield of maturity on the bond, or you can use this equation which is the risk-free rate plus the risk premiums. Credit default risk premium, maturity risk, risk premium, liquidity risk premium. So as you can see, in both the cost of the equity and the cost of the debt, there's the risk-free rate. So as the Fed drives interest rates extremely low or negative, it's going to drive these risk, this risk-free rate down, drive the cost of debt down, going to drive the risk-free rate down and drive the cost of the equity down and drive the weighted average cost of capital down. So as the cost of capital goes down, it's going to lift the present value and the net present values, which is going to allow companies to be able to make investment decisions. So driving interest rates zero or negative would lower their cost of capital and allow them to continue to invest. But what a lot of companies have done over the last 10 years is not to borrow cheaply and invest in plant equipment or marketing programs or new products and services. They've used the money to buy back their stock, to inflate their stock prices. So in the short run, short to medium term, it will be beneficial um, for the economy to stimulate it, but if interest rates continue to stay negative for a long period of time, investors will start to look at the negative inflation rates and say, that only means that we're going to be in a recession for a long period of time. So be stimulative in maybe the short to medium term, but in the long run, it could have negative interest rates could have a negative effect. Okay, that's our biggest fear. Let me make sure my camera is on me. And then uh, what will it have on asset prices? Now, I built two models here. Asset price or value model equals CFO, that's cash flows, future cash flows, T plus one. So there's two models, okay, two simple valuation models. Future cash flow for the company divided by the expected return, and I can use the capital asset pricing model that's that for that equation, minus the constant growth rate in the cash flows. This is the constant growth rate model to get valuations. I can also use what is called a perpetuity model that looks at future cash flows. When the cash flows are forecasted to remain flat forever, divided by the expected return or discount rate or interest rate, depending on what type of asset of paper or real that you're looking at. So we know that if the Federal Reserve drives interest rates negative or really low, it's going to lower the risk-free rates. It's going to lower the cost of capital. It's going to lower the expected returns. And if they lower the expected returns, what happens to the valuations? If this goes down, this goes, come on, you guys. This goes down, this goes, this goes down, this goes, this goes down, this goes, oh, got it. Okay. And then here in this model, same thing. Interest rates are going down, and this is a bond. Interest rates go down, and what happens to bond prices? Interest rates go down, bond prices go up. Interest rates go down, bond prices go up. And if I'm using net operating income for the real estate asset, if the expected returns go down, then the value of real estate goes up. Got it. Okay? Okay? So 
So what's happening is values are not going up because the cash flows are, are increasing because of economic demand. Asset prices are going up because of overly accommodated monetary policy that's driving interest rates and costs of capital and discount rates down significantly, inflating the asset prices. So the Fed's trying to reflate the system in extreme recessionary conditions. Now you can you read these finance books, never mentioned any of this stuff. And those books are like pretty current, they're probably 2014, 15. No mention in the investment books, no mention in the finance books. So you study finance, you study economics, and there's no realization, there's no real application to it. You're just reading basically 10 years, 20 years of theory with no application. This is total application. Because you need to understand this stuff. So it's gonna, it's gonna prop up asset prices, um, probably in the short to medium term, but in the long run could have a negative feedback loop, could have a negative effect. Um, what about savers? You know, I wanna buy a 10 year JGB, a 10 year Japanese bond, negative 50 basis points. I want to buy a German bond or bund at negative 10 basis points. I want to buy a 10-year treasury at 1.3%. Is that good? If you were a saver that was saving for your retirement, so you were putting a lot of your money in your government sovereign bonds, and they were paying you 1.3%, but inflation's running at 2.5%, what's your real return? Let's say you're getting 1.5 and inflation's at 2.5. What's your real return? Losing a percent. Negative 1% on 100 basis points. Are you going to be better off in the end? No, you didn't host it, right? Your purchasing power is being inflated away. Your standard of living is going to be lower in the future. Okay. So for savers, it's horrendous. And if you talk to the German retirees, if you talk to the Japanese retirees, they're going freaking literally insane, okay? Because their culture is around savings um, can be improved. And to see their lifestyle and see their savings be deteriorated away and know that their standard of living for them and their kids are gonna be lower in the future is driving them literally nuts, okay? And that leads to populist politics in the end, okay? Which is enough negative externality. What about investors? Well, investors would benefit, wouldn't they? Because if the Fed over-accommodates, drives drive interest rates negative or zero, it's going to drive down the expected returns, the interest rates, the cost of capital, and prop up asset prices. So if you're one of the upper 90th percentile that actually owns paper or real assets, the majority of the population doesn't own anything, really. They look paycheck to paycheck. Uh, but if you're lucky enough to be in the top 70th or 90th percentile where the majority of the wealth is actually held, you at that economic strata are going to benefit significantly through the reflation of those asset prices. Okay. And then what about businesses? Well, businesses will benefit because it's going to lower their cost of capital. They're going to be able to refinance their balance sheets. They're going to be able to borrow cheaply. They're going to be able to invest cheaply if they invest or borrow at even a cheaper rate and buy back their stock prices and inflate their stock prices through financial engineering and accounting gimmicks as opposed to from the real economy, the numerator as opposed to the denominator. Okay. All right. Isn't this fun? That's probably the, the most heaviest and hardcore per, portion of the finance uh, class. You didn't know you were going to get a history, history lesson, did you? How, how am I doing on time? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll spend like five minutes and then that's it. Is everybody writing that stuff down so you have really good notes? Okay, awesome. Any questions or anything on that? Because that's pretty complicated. Yeah, that took me about um, 10 years to study. Well, it actually was longer than that, probably 12 years. So really trying to think about it, read about it. Thought I'd bring it in, in the uh, the next is the disc is uh, yield curve dynamics, the discount rate and the expected return. 
We talked about that over there with the capital asset pricing model. The weighted average cost of capital, those are discount rates. Those are calculations of expected returns. And we use those expected returns as discount rates, to discount those cash flows to try to determine what the effect's going to be on asset values and how to make investment decisions. Okay, so this is really foundation. But first, when we start to build a discount rate that we're going to use for investment decision making, we're going to try to forecast where we think discount rates are going to go in the future. We start with the fishing plan. And the Fisher equation determines nominal interest rates. Okay, nominal interest rates. And the yield curve, you know, is upward sloping. I'll go through this again on Tuesday. Um, but it's the real rate and inflation expectations. And we know that the real rate is constant in the short run. So movements in interest rates and movements in yield curves are driven by changes in inflation expectations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to end it there, and I'll go over the um, dynamic yield curves. And I already showed you some of that, you know, on the uh, on the first day. And then we'll just keep working through this uh, this exam. And you can start on the uh, the problems at the back um, are taken from the homeworks, and I already provide you with the solutions, so you can go ahead and fill those out so you have your study guide. Completed, and then we'll continue to work through uh, this first part. And I think between the, uh, the homework problems and the uh, in class problems and extra credit problems, that stuff, you guys are getting a lot of practice on it. You're fine. If you have any questions, you know, just let me know how I can help you. Do you have any questions? Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Oh, no, or, yeah, I was going to catch up. How are you?